plenty of Americans didn't properly understand Formula One back in 2005, and I could see why. At Indianapolis, the F1 circuit arrived and transformed their iconic track into something they barely recognised. Instead of driving the cars at insane speeds around a giant oval for 500 miles of IndyCar racing, we'd instead created our own twisty little circuit with right hand as well as left hand turns in the infield. Welcome back to another Tales from the Treehouse. Uh, yeah, today we're going to be talking about that fateful race in 2005 in Indianapolis where only six cars ended up doing the actual Formula One Grand Prix. What a joke it was, what a farce from Formula One's perspective. I was there in the thick of things. I was embarrassed to be part of the Formula One circus that particular day. And so I thought we could recall some of those moments, some of the experiences that I went through, some of the feelings that were going on inside the team and inside the garage when I can only really imagine what the world outside was looking on and thinking of Formula One during that spell. When practice got underway on Friday, things went pretty well for us on track. Kimi seemed strong, but Ralph Schumacher had a big accident in his Toyota, coming off the high speed banking at turn 13. And that was where this whole thing began, this big tyre blowout from uh, Ralph Schumacher on his Toyota, which was a huge accident, really high speed. I remember watching it in the garages, on the screens in the garage, thinking, my goodness, I, you know, first of all, I hope he's okay, but that was huge. And when we investigated that, or when they investigated that, they realised that the accident had happened because of a tyre failure. And then, as we went through the rest of Friday practice, there were more than one of these tyre failures. Not quite as big as Ralph's, but there were some significant failures, but only on the Michelin tyres. And all of these engineers and, and people at Michelin and the team started obviously to get very concerned. And a lot of meetings started happening about what we could do about it, because there wasn't a simple solution. On Saturday morning, we started to, or we were told by Michelin to raise the tyre pressures of our cars, which is not something we wanted to do because it would compromise performance, but it would firm up the tyres and give them a little bit, potentially a little bit more durability. We did that still didn't work. There were still issues, still signs of failure on some of the tyres that were being investigated after the sessions. Now at this point there were some bizarre uh, ideas being bandied around about what we could do from putting chicanes in on the circuit to putting speed limits in for the Michelin shod cars. Most of the grid was Michelin, only three teams were running Bridgestone tyres which were absolutely fine. And so at that stage over the course of Friday nobody really knew what on earth was going to happen come the race apart from one or two people who had a pretty good idea. While all this had been going on across Friday evening and Saturday morning, one or two people in the paddock had cottoned on to a potential scam. A few people speculated that there probably wouldn't be a solution to such a serious problem, not at such short notice anyway. Theories of what might happen should the Michelin tyres continue to cause safety issues became a chat around the track. And we even joked about packing up early or rescheduling the race for another weekend. But by Saturday lunchtime, after more Michelin failures in third practice, groups of gamblers up and down the pit lane were online looking up the bookmaker's odds on a number of unusual outcomes for the race. <laughs> now, I clearly remember this. I remember, you know, all the mechanics and engineers, we all talk in the paddock in the evenings whilst people are, are sort of working away and having a break. You all come out at the back of your garages, you have a chat, a conversation. People started coming up to me saying, have you been online? Have you checked the odds for some of these, um, the outcomes of the race? Because lots of people were starting to lump huge sums of money on the fact that there probably wouldn't be a solution and therefore the chances are that Michelin would not be able to take part in the race. Now if that happened, that would leave just three teams, six cars able to take part in the US Grand Prix. With only six cars, two of them were Ferraris, two were Jordans and two were Minardis, normally right at the back of the grid. We can pretty much guarantee that Ferrari would take first and second spot, but that would mean that the third place, the final podium spot, would be a Jordan. An unlikely scenario would be that the Minardis would score points, given that there are only six cars in the race. Now, that's unheard of. So people were putting huge sums of money on online bookmakers for a Jordan to get a podium and a Minardi to score points. And um, the odds were ridiculous and people kept coming up to me going, you need to just chuck everything you've got on this because our team have told us that it's highly unlikely we're going to be taking part in this event. Now at McLaren we hadn't been told any such thing. In fact, we'd been told pretty much the opposite, that everybody was trying everything they could to make sure this race went underway, which they were. And there were all sorts of scenarios being talked about, some of which were bizarre. 
and it went right through Saturday. We got to qualifying, which did go ahead. That was deemed safe because it was only a, a one lap flyer, of course, and the tyres were failing after extended stints. So qualifying was okay to go ahead, and actually for us, it went really well. Kimi ended up second on the grid. It was a great start to the weekend in that sense. But our team had been really cagey, saying that we should carry on as normal, we should prepare the cars as normal. From as far as we were concerned, nothing changes. By Saturday night, all bets were off. The bookmakers had shut the market down as news began to break of the significance of Michelin's woes. But by then, many people throughout the paddock had plenty riding on what could be a disastrous outcome for Formula One. On the morning of the race, we still continued as instructed as if everything was fine. It seemed impossible for the major parties involved to agree on a common solution, despite the best efforts of lots of people to try and make sure that we were able to put on a show for the huge crowd. Kimmy's attitude was, let's just all get on with it. Sorry, I should have done that in my Kimmy accent, shouldn't I? Let's all just get on with it. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> and by then, we all agreed. Um, so we did agree. We kind of thought, look, this is getting ridiculous now. We do just have to carry on regardless. We need to, as far as mechanics go, we need to just do our job. We need to get the car ready. By Sunday morning, we were preparing for the race as if it was just going ahead like normal. Because the truth is, nobody knew. With just half an hour to go before the pit lane opened on race day, Sunday afternoon, we'd been told to get the drivers in the car, strap them in, make the cars ready to go, but hold everybody in the garage. And Dave Ryan, the team manager, who stood at the front of a garage, was waiting with his phone in his hand for a call from Ron Dennis, who was buried deep in a really high level meeting to desperately try and find some kind of solution to this problem. We're all sitting there on tent hooks not even knowing if we were going to go to the grid and take part in this race or not. And then, and this is so un Ron Dennis like, with just a few minutes until the pit lane was due to close within the regulations, Ron literally burst into the back of the garage, running through, sweaty, out of breath, hair a mess, not like Ron at all. And he just screamed, go, go, go. And he was waving his arms around. And in that moment, everything just burst into life. We, lowered, we took the tyre blankets off the cars, we fired them up, they launched out of the garage and off we went to the grid. On the grid, with Kimmy having got out the car to go for his toilet break, talk to his engineer, I prepared everything ready to go as if it was a normal race. Everything at that stage was happening as planned. With just 10 minutes to the race start, I strapped Kimmy back into his seat. As ever, he just wanted to race. The surrounding drama was an unnecessary distraction. But as I reached in and connected Kimmy's radio cable and his drinks pipe to his crash helmet, Ron came and crouched down next to us. He leaned in towards Kimmy. Kimmy, I've just come out of a meeting and it's been decided that we'll do the formation lap and then peel off into the pit lane and retire from the event, he said in his usual commanding voice. All of your immediate competitors will be doing the same. Do you understand? Kimmy was furious. This is f***ing bollocks. Let's just f***ing race. We're here to race. Let's just f***ing race. <laughs> <laughs> Kimmy snapped Ron, angry that he was being disobeyed. If none of these other guys want to race, they can go home, continued Kimmy. We're just here to race, so let's do it. Any attempts to placate him just weren't working. It's a fucking load of bucks. <laughs> Ron quickly pulled rank. Kimmy, I'm speaking as your boss. You will pull into the pits at the end of the formation lap. Do you understand? Kimmy sat in the car, shaking his head. I awkwardly adjusted the side of his crash helmet, pretending I was oblivious to the unfolding drama. Ron was enraged. I could sense it over my shoulder without even looking up. And I promise you, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I'm stuck in the middle of this argument between Kimmy and Ron. I mean, literally, he was rubbing up against my shoulder. That's how close. Our heads were this close to each other. They were both having to shout because it was noisy. Kimmy had a crash helmet on. And I was right there in the midst of this blazing row that I had never witnessed the like of before. Kimmy, that is an order, said Ron. He stood up and walked away. It was an interesting psychological battle and Ron had lost something I'd never seen before. I gave Kimmy a look as if to say, what the hell are you gonna do? And he looked back, still fuming, but I could see a naughty smile revealing itself through his visor. <laughs> now, that was just before the race start. I genuinely had no idea what Kimmy was about to do. We went through the procedure, we fired the car up, 
we pulled the blankets off the tyres, we moved away, the cars went off for their formation lap. Kimmy was so angry and at that stage, as we normally do, we start to head back towards the pits. No idea what was about to happen. Now I, at that stage, was the only one that was aware of this plan of all the Michelin runners were going to pull into the pit lane at the end of the formation lap because I'd been inadvertently briefed by Ron Dennis, the team principal. I got back to the garage, still not knowing. I told a few of my mates what was supposed to be happening, still not really knowing what Kimmy was about to do. As the cars came round to the end of their formation lap, Jarno Truly, who was on pole for that particular race, duly pulled into the pit lane. I watched on the screens, wondering whether Kimmy was just going to go and race anyway. And I genuinely would not have been surprised. But at the last moment, he pulled in towards the pit lane and came trundling along the pit lane towards us. Kimmy's radio burst into life again. There was more swearing, loss of it. <laughs> he just wanted to race after all. He was angry at the farce he was being forced to participate in. As was I, by the way. We waited for the car to swing towards us in the pit lane and before we could even reverse it back towards the garage, Kimmy had undone his belts, leapt from the cockpit and was striding back to his room in the garage. Now, Dave Ryan, the team manager, had come on the radio and said, right, guys, the, car, the cars are gonna pull into the pit lane, but I want you to keep the drivers strapped into the cars, just reverse them up to the front of the garage, because even at that stage, there were still some big meetings happening about whether or not we might still get a race underway. I had to come on the radio and say, uh, Dave, I'm afraid Kimmy's already left. He's probably getting changed and not far off being on his way home by now. <laughs> It was an absolute joke. The whole race was a farce. The event was a farce. I felt sorry for the American fans whilst this race with just six uh, Bridgestone cars was taking place and we were packing up the garage in the background. Obviously the two Ferraris won, although do you remember they nearly wiped each other out at one point. I clearly remember laughing at that in the garage. Uh, the Jordans of course came third and fourth and the Minardis picked up fifth and sixth spot taking their points. A lot of people up and down the pit lane made an awful lot of money out of that joke of a Grand Prix. And I remember from our point of view, you know, we were furious. It was such a bizarre and disappointing event. It was one of the craziest days of motor racing I've ever been involved with. By the time the race had finished, we were pretty much already packed up, hoping to get away from the circuit earlier. Early, but the circuit officials had warned us that the crowd outside was so angry that it was within our, it was for our own safety that it was better to stay inside the confines of the circuit until the crowd had dissipated. So frustratingly, we were finished, we were packed up, we were ready, and yet we couldn't really go anywhere. We had to stay in the garages for a couple of hours, really, until the crowds had dispersed, everybody had calmed down, and eventually we got to leave the circuit. When it was safe enough to finally go home, we drove out, passing one memorable race fan left at the gate all on his own, holding up a handwritten sign on a piece of cardboard that simply said, F1 sucks. And on that particular day, I couldn't help but agree with him. There you go. Another Tales from the Treehouse. I hope you enjoyed this one. There's going to be more where this came from because I think it's a really nice, fun idea. If you've got any suggestions of moments from F1 history that I might have been involved with and have a particularly interesting insight on, just drop me a line and maybe it could be the next episode. See you later.